I called in a flash flood warning about three hours ago for this one. Down this way is Buckskin Gulch, it's a few miles from here. And uh, hopefully they evacuated because there's a flood coming. I can hear it right now. I've been down, going down Buckskin, Buckskin in Korea for 10, 15 years now. Many years, I've gone down many, many times. Um, and uh, uh, we had this trip planned for several weeks. And uh, we drove all night on Friday night, arrived at Lee's Ferry on Saturday morning, got a shuttle up to Wire Pass, and uh, went on down. We did check the weather forecast, and uh, um, obviously during this time of year, you never know what's gonna happen but uh, weather forecast uh, looked about as good as it could get. Yeah, Buckskin Gulch, obviously a uh, very remote area. Um, once you're in the canyon, there's certainly no cell phone reception. Uh, you're so far away from any sort of indication of what's going on in the outside world. You can't even see the sky. You're down in a, down in a crack in the earth and the sky is just a little sliver above you. So uh, all you know is when you go in, is the weather good? Is the weather forecast, what is the weather, weather forecast calling for? If you're going to stay in Buckskin, one of the safest places is at the uh, hazardous middle route uh, exit, which is where we stay, which is about eight miles, eight miles down. Prior to that spot, uh, it's like a it's like a narrow hallway that goes up for I don't know 100 feet or more, um, and uh, if a flood comes through there, you're just getting washed out. There's nothing nothing to hold on to, nothing to stand on. Uh, it's just going to be a just a, a freight train of water coming through the canyon. Yeah, there's there's some areas where you're walking through with your pack and you kind of get stuck as you're walking through because the walls are super tight and they just go up so, for hundreds of feet. Yeah, there's all sorts of evidence of previous floods through there. You see logs and debris jammed up sometimes 100 feet above the canyon floor. So you're very aware that you're in a flood zone when you're when you're there. Um, now where we camp at the uh, at the escape route. Uh, it widens out a bit. I don't know how wide you can see. 30 feet or so? Yeah, 30 or feet. More. 30 yeah. feet or more. It, it opens up, um, which means that any flood coming through is going to kind of dissipate a little bit. There's pools of water everywhere that you're wading through. And then when you're going under them, and especially in the narrow spots, there's debris, wood, driftwood, hearts of trees that are all wedged between the rocks in the canyon. Like Leaf said, a couple feet above you and then up, upwards in the canyon. If the flood had happened an hour earlier, we would have been up in the narrows and we would we'd all be dead. If it happened an hour later, uh, um, for those of us who were actually camped in the canyon on the bed, on the stream bed itself, we would have been gone. So it just happened, the flood came through at a moment when we were still in camp. Um, the two of us were in a tent, she was in a tent, and everyone else was kind of up on the ledge, cooking food, uh, etc. I, well, my first thought was, flash flood because I'm just like scared of everything all the time. So I was like, is that a flash flood? And then he gave me a look like, no, it's not a flash flood. Like it's just a breeze. But then we both were like, it's not a breeze, it's a flood. I also think for Randall and I, whenever I thought of a flash flood, I thought, oh, it would be raining and then something would happen. Previous year it was raining, we went to higher ground immediately because we didn't know what was happening above us. But just, it was completely sunny, like such a beautiful day. And when the flood came, it wasn't raining, nothing was happening, it was just water. And I think, for me, that was shocking to me because it, nothing, there was no indication that any water was going to come down. Yeah, I remember looking up at the stars at, after it all went down and just like, damn. Well, yeah, so we all set up our tents relatively close to each other. Reinald and I over here, we were the first, so we were at the, the, upper, the upper end of the canyon. So if anything was going to happen, we were going to be hit first and then everyone was down below us, but I know some people were up on the ledge, like Cinta brought a lot of her stuff yeah. up on the ledge just to make dinner and hang out, so it was a really beautiful view. Yeah, I went up to the ledge uh, just to take a nap. Yeah. I was pretty tired after driving the whole way down here from Boulder. Yeah, I fell asleep, I fell asleep on the ledge while I was reading a book, and then I woke up to what Kaylee was talking about, that like windstorm sound, and then screaming, and looking down into the off the high ground and seeing that the water started rushing in and taking out, taking gear and stuff away.
would probably have 10 seconds to scramble, like scramble up the rock. Yeah. I mean, like no matter how prepared you are, it doesn't matter. Like, to give an idea, like, lucky. Turner started yelling. I was dead asleep. By the time I even stood up, it was already full of water. So yeah, and I think so I think Cinta and a lot of people, the reason why they got out of their tents was because my brother, since we were the first tent, I was dead asleep in the tent. He was just about to go to bed. He sees the water and starts screaming at me. And by the time that the water had come, I was already, I woke up completely underwater. He grabbed me, pulled me out of the tent and essentially saved me from the water. Otherwise I would have been dragged down. And that's, and then Cinta, everyone rallied to get out of their tent to go get to high ground. I was dead asleep. I fell asleep at around 7.15. That's when I last looked at my clock. I put my phone in my pack, was ready to go. There was no way I was going to use it anyway. Um, woke up an hour later to him dragging me by the back of my back of my shirt, dragging me out of the water, completely submerged in water, ripped our tent open, dragged me out to get me out. He ended up gets, getting sucked down the stream because of the pressure and um, how fast it was running ended up grabbing up the other side of the canyon wall and I ran to safety. He was stuck on the other side of the canyon for about an hour and a half until the water subsided. Yeah, he saved me. I would have been completely underwater. I would have been in a net going down the stream. There's no way I would have been out of the tent if he wasn't there with me. We got out of the tent. We both had to run up the canyon to get to safe, safe ground as the wall of water is coming down the canyon at us. Um, but the, the way that kind of the topography of the canyon that came around the corner and we are on the left um, running up on dry ground. That's when I ran into some rocks, broke some toes, dislocated a toe, um, and I was able to get on high ground. Meanwhile, people were screaming for each other. It's getting dark. But I was still sleeping up on the top of the ledge where a leaf ended up coming running down. So I woke up to everyone screaming. I'm standing up, walking down. I was in REM sleep, so still like, what is going on? <laughs> See the water, leaf runs up and then it's not a, it's a pretty steep incline too, coming up the rock that we ended up uh, making camp on. So he comes up and then just falls. He's like, my feet are broken. And then uh, the next person I saw was Pyrenee coming up covered in water, uh, yelling that Reinhold got taken down the um, flood. So then I went down and started looking, saw him get to the other side, and then just started yelling for him to climb forward and climb high. Yeah, I remember I when I when I ran down and I first heard the screaming, I was, I immediately got off and tried to grab everything. And the first thought, the first thing I saw was Pyrenee coming up covered in mud and screaming, "I don't know where I don't know where Reinhold is. Go find Reinhold." And I went and grabbed the tent and grabbed my back because I knew that the gear I had in there was I had my beacon and a first aid kit and some other really important stuff that we needed, so including food and water. So I immediately grabbed all that and then went back down and saw the Billy. Um, was watching Reinhold and I saw him get swept, swept down and then managed to grab onto something and then climb along this other side of the rim and then try across and then we told him not to and then go back up trying to get to higher ground. And then I immediately grabbed my beacon, my personal locator beacon, and went to the top and went to the widest mouth of canyon and set it off, hoping that maybe it would send up a signal. So I guess what Perry was saying earlier was that she pretty much went to bed. We were both really tired. I told her that I still needed to like brush my teeth, get ready for bed. Um, I needed to take out my contacts. So I ended up doing that and then crawled over her and the door was, the door to the tent was on her side of the, um, was on her side of the tent. So I laid down on my sleeping pad. She was already pretty much asleep. I ended up pretty much like in the days of almost sleep, but I was awake enough to like be hearing people talk and I guess I heard the wind. But I didn't think of anything about the wind. I just thought it was going to come, pass, and be done with. Um, I heard Turner's tell me to get up. He just, he like, he didn't scream it, but he was just like, get up. So I obviously, um, I obviously stood up, or not stood up, but sat up, looked up, up the up the canyon, and saw water rush around the corner. And although I had my contacts, I was still able to like process that that was a flash flood. So I jumped over my sister, unzipped the tent, stood up, and like. By that point, the water had already reached us, and so she got she got pulled under, I guess, the water. And so I, since the tent was already unzipped all the way, I grabbed the door in the main part of the tent and just started ripping it, just solely due to being more able, more room for her to escape if need be. Um, after that, it was pretty much just 
water pushing on me until I was downstream and I wasn't able to really see much just due to not having my contacts in. But I just noticed everyone was scrambling up to high ground while I was unable to really, really set my feet in the ground or do anything able to resist the water pushing me down. I was able to be, like I was, after being swept down probably, I don't know, how far would you guys say into that tunnel? 75 meters. Sure, yeah. And I was able to grab onto the wall. It wasn't really anything like to grab onto, but it was enough friction that I was able to hold on to it while the water was pushing me down and able to climb up the wall to enough safety where I wasn't worried about the water getting me anymore. But when I got out, it was it was something that, it, like I wasn't paying attention how deep the water was because I was just trying to get a foothold or a handhold. But when I got out, I literally was just looking at myself and I was just caked in mud. So obviously I was just in water, like full body, just swimming as best as I could. I don't really have anything else to relate it to, but it's just a lot of pressure on your body. You can't even like stand up in it. It's just, it'll sweep you away no matter what you're trying to do. Once I looked up after I heard to, to get up, I looked up and saw the water coming around the corner and that was probably 30 feet, like a distance away that it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be terrifying if it was just like a stream of water. But I literally jumped out of the tent as quick as I could, unzipped it and got out. And by that point, the water had already reached us. For a second, I, it's just like, it doesn't even register. It's just like, this is a dream. Like, this is like, uh, when I saw it come around the corner, but it's, it's also just like, I mean, Ryan all was talking about like getting out and being caked in mud, like it's opaque. Um, like it's, it's frothing, um, but it's not like white water either, because it's just full of all this yes. brew mud. Um, it's hard to talk. It, it looked to me, when, it, when we were running up the canyon to escape, what it looked like to me, it looked like just rolling at us. Um, like I just saw, like she was ahead of me, and you just see this rolling thing. I mean, this is dry ground. The canyon is dry. There's nothing quite like seeing this wall of rolling water and debris coming right at you. And if it was low, if it was low, you'd be like, I can, I can handle that. You, 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 there wouldn't be this panic. But what you see is just this wall coming down at you, and uh, there was, yeah, there was so much like there was debris in there where. The, when I got out of the tent, the, a huge log grabbed our tent, is what brought our tent down the river, is the log um, dragged everything. So if I was in there, it probably would have hit me. Other stuff was in there, branches, rocks, and boulders, and things that were in there. You could hear boulders rolling. Yeah. yeah, yeah there, we have a video of him saying, I could hear huge boulders shifting down the canyon. So with these flash floods, when you have a wide stream bed, uh, it may be just a few feet deep. But when it gets down into the narrow canyons, that same amount of water has to go through a much narrower area and the water level becomes a lot deeper and the water moves a lot faster. So where we were camped, it widened out again about, I don't know, 30 feet. It dropped down, but it was still four feet deep. You can't walk, you can't stand, you can't do anything in that. Uh, that's very deadly. Uh, you know, another 75 meters down the canyon, it got narrower again. So where we were, completely deadly. But once it, if we had been washed back into a narrow section, there's nothing that, that we could have done. He got washed down right in front, right back to that mouth. If he couldn't made it, if he didn't get grabbed ground there, he would have been washed for miles. Well, we didn't necessarily know we were going to get out of it until we heard the helicopter, and even then, we didn't know until we were like helicoptered out. But as soon as we were on the higher ground, like. We just started playing over every single contingency that was like possible moving forward. Like, all right, we have this much water. Like, how long? How many days do we need to keep it for? Like, are we going to have to try to hike out? Can we go up over the top and hike out? No, we can't. It's open desert. Uh, like, we just we just went through everything over and over and over and over again. Even though we'd already talked about it, it was like just like this shared experience. I, th I think like our main our main factor was we needed to get him out of the canyon because of his feet. We were all confident that at some point we could hike out, but we were like, there's no way for him to hike out. And it got to a point where we were all trying to stay in the shade as much as possible. We went down in little nooks and crannies so that we wouldn't get dehydrated. We made, we made crosses, like Haley said, to try to alert things above if anyone saw us. We even started a, a miniature fire to send smoke signals was sound crazy, but it got to the point where we didn't really know how we were going to get out. Billy and Turner even 
thought of putting all of our sleeping pads together in a raft-like float so that we could potentially float him down the river. He pulled her out of the river, she could have died, he got washed down, he could have died, but everyone was just completely calm and methodical in terms of what do we need to do. We didn't have our sleeping pads, we put all the pads together, we all just spooned. You know, <laughs> got very close to each other. I can't walk because my feet are broken. So we're all like, you know, three feet away. I'm trying to take a leap. You know, it's like we're all like very close. We were close before, now we're really close. So. <laughs> we all uh, ate, slept, and got rid of our uh, bodily fluids in yeah. 30 by 30 feet. <laughs> And we put up, I mean, we, we, we lost our tent poles. We did have a fly, so the next day we put up a fly just to cover for shade. Um, we, we put out the pads for signaling. Um, was, he was, he, Billy was in Afghanistan, uh, served in the US military. Uh, um, most of us have a tremendous amount of outdoor experience, but even the most experienced people uh, faced with a situation like that, you never know what's gonna happen until it actually gets. I also want to say too, like having the personal locator beacon was probably what saved us and it's the only reason that search and rescue came. So if you're in a situation where you're doing anything outdoors or anywhere that could be any type of dangerous situation, having something to get a hold of a search and rescue team is crucial. I um, would like to thank the Kane County Search and Rescue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they are incredible and mainly volunteer based and we're so great getting us out and being like really supportive and kind and really really wonderful well, when we got out so thank you yeah it was incredible yeah. search and rescue folks were amazing yeah. yeah i mean everyone in page area yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just like so oh my gosh yeah. to pat yeah yeah i've been in page arizona for years i never knew how friendly everyone was <laughs> <laughs> holy heck the the damn bar and grill they fed they yeah. 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 yeah we're staying right now we're staying in the house of the emt who drove us out of the ambulance so uh yeah kudos to page arizona and then kane county utah for their incredible uh i mean four different agencies were uh were in the search and rescue operation not a single person like was off it was everyone was incredibly uh organized and, and generous